Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Alex, welcome to my TED Talk, which is actually much more of a fireside chat, if you will. Um, think of me as your friendly female narrator. Uh, I do have images to accompany this talk. I tried filming them, but um, the screen just looks white and not good. So I'm hoping that um, you can just follow along with the PDF that I will include and I will act as your friendly guide through this fireside chat slash TED talk. Um, to preface, uh, the title of this talk is Out of the Shadows, um, Championing Women in Architecture. It is in no way, shape, or form comprehensive um, of all the women that, you know, have kind of, kind of been overlooked in, in the field. Um, it is, is very much a kind of snapshot of just a few that I found particularly interesting. Um, I wanted to give these women their own voices, their own narratives, and very much to do that in isolation outside of the men that were important to them. But I, I found that really difficult because I, I think tragically, potentially the reason we actually know about them is because of the collaborative work that they did um, with men around them or the men that came before them or the men that came after them. Um, so again, this is in no way, shape or form completely comprehensive, um, but more of an introduction to um, their lives. So let's get started. First up, we are going to visit ancient Egypt and we are going to look at uh, Hot Shiput. She was a female pharaoh. Um, whose name means foremost of noble women. She ruled from 1473 to 1458. She was the wife, um, which was common for women that ascended into power of this time, of Thutmose II. Together they had one daughter. And upon the death of her husband, um, because they only had a daughter, uh, the reign was called into question. And so eventually what happened is there was a nephew, Thutmose III, that um, was decided as the ruler. He was, however, very, very young. And so Hatshepsut effectively became like the queen regent. Um, so she stepped in to rule um, because of his age. Um, during her reign, she rose quickly to power. She became very adept at brokering um, diplomatic trade. She was extremely learned. She was also a skilled designer and, you know, one of the first architects. What was fascinating is unlike previous female rulers in Egypt um, who were viewed as queens or, you know, important women. Hatshepsut put, try to say that three times fast. Um, she became a deity. She became a pharaoh in the true sense of the word pharaoh. Um, depictions of her are seen as masculine. She often has a beard. She does retain some of her femininity, which is actually part of the identifying reason you can tell it's her um, in certain images. Um, you can see on the, the first slide the defiled face um, of Hotshep put on one of her statues. So, like I mentioned, during her rule, she did come up with a, a seafaring trade route, which brought a lot of economic success to the kingdom. She also erected um, lots of different buildings, notably two large obelisks at the Temple of Karnak. Um, her crowning achievement, however, is the image on the next slide that you're looking at um, called Dar al-Bari. Um, it is a temple in the Valley of the Kings, 
which was super smart on her part because she wanted to be in conjunction, in placement with all of the other rulers that were legit pharaohs that were viewed as gods of Egypt. Um, it is now her mausoleum. It is, it is significant, um, one, for its size, and two, for kind of the modernity of the structure. Um, it's known for its porticos and central staircase. The interior was also adorned with lots of murals and reliefs and hieroglyphs all bearing her name and her numerous achievements. Um, you can see, if you look at the structure, how its clean lines and columns and porticos are obviously echoed throughout architectural history. I mean, we just looked at the Renaissance and then after that, the Baroque and even the Neoclassical. And you can see how something that she erected, you know, is still relevant in design. Um, after her reign... Um, her name, literally, the hieroglyphs that represented her as a character, um, and again, her face on statues and numerous murals were completely desecrated. So there are a couple of different theories as to why and who. Um, the most popular, popular from contemporary Egyptologists is that it was Thutmose III, who was her stepson, who then became the ruler, um, tried to basically eradicate her from their history and their lineage. I don't know if he was scared um, of the succession or his right to rule. Um, that's, that's arguably the most popular theory, but literally, um, if you go ahead and click to the next slide, you'll see that she was wiped. Another theory, um, besides the one that, you know, they were trying to maintain the right to rule, is that she was a very successful ruler. She's one of very few females that reached the status of true pharaoh, and so historians suspect that maybe they were looking to prevent the possibility of another female inserting herself into the long line of Egyptian male kings. So moving into slightly more contemporary times, we're going to go ahead and look at Marion Moni Griffin. Um, she was arguably the first licensed female architect in the United States. She was definitely the second woman to graduate um, from MIT, and she was Frank Lloyd Wright's first employee at his architecture firm in Chicago. She was a superior draftsman. If you look at the next slide, you'll see um, some of her very iconic um, watercolor style uh, imagery that became signature of what people think of when they think of Frank Lloyd Wright. In 1910, um, a German publisher came to Frank Lloyd Wright and said, hey, you know, your, your work has become so iconic. We'd like to do a portfolio of all of your current buildings and some, you know, maybe that haven't been erected, but are, but are, you know, all of your sketches. And this became known as the Wasmuth portfolio. Ernst Wasmuth was the publisher and it was a hundred lithographs of Wright's work, either imagined or actually erected. And it became notable because it went on to kind of become a touchstone, a cultural touchstone or a reference point um, in architecture and influenced Le Corbusier, Schindler, Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius. Um, upon later inspection, it was found out that over 50% of the lithographs and drawings in that like compendium were not even rights. They were definitely Monies. Um, so whilst she was never given credit um, for her contribution to that, one thing that was um, pretty monumental that came of her fairly long career was she was uh, the founder of the Prairie School. Um, she actually didn't like to call it the Prairie School. She called it the Chicago Group style. Um, characteristics of the Prairie School, again, are 
commonly attributed to Frank Lloyd Wright. It's going to be the reverence to horizontality and homage to the plains of the Midwest um, and also a hearkening back to things that are handmade. So you had the Industrial Revolution that had just happened and you have things being mass produced and this is looking at a way to slow down and really value things that are crafted. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that before the dissolution of Wright's um, architecture firm, uh, Moni actually met Walter Burley Griffin, who became her husband. He was also an architect and a Wright firm alumni. Um, together, they entered a design competition to reimagine Australia's capital, Canberra. Uh, they won, and what you see here is a map of their reimagining of the capital. And so they actually moved to Australia, they started their own firm, and together they oversaw construction of many, many joint projects. Moving forward, um, and actually it's fairly similar time in history, um, maybe a little more current, uh, we have Eileen Gray. So Eileen Gray was born into a wealthy upper middle class Irish family. Uh, her father was a landscape painter and he and her family encouraged her to go into the arts. So she attended numerous art schools in Paris and she found that she really enjoyed and had a knack for interior design with an emphasis on lacquer work. So that, if you go to the next slide, is the lovely Eileen Gray. Um, in Paris, she became acquainted with society of Paris, um, particularly with fashion designers and one particular fashion designer who also owned a millinery shop. Uh, Gray there honed her craft and she started to produce furniture. Most famously, what you're seeing on that slide is the E1027 table and the Baladucci chair. She was known for Rue de Lata apartment. Um, it was the epitome of Art Deco and included, again, some of her famous furniture designs. The success of that collaboration with the fashion designer actually led her to open her own store in Paris where she showcased her designs, which were furniture, rugs, exotic woods, furs. Um, she did have a budding interest in architecture and you see as time goes on and she becomes more interested in like the modernist movement that her work gets cleaner. It becomes way more streamlined. Um, she began dating Jean Badovici. He was 15 years her junior. He was also an architect and really influential in encouraging her to pursue architecture. So she kind of jumped full force into it. She learned to draft. She studied theory. Um, she, you know, went through all of the education and became an architect of her own right. She purchased a plot of land, a plot of land, excuse me, outside of Monaco. Um, my French is horrible, so I'm going to butcher that name, but it's Roquenbrun Cap Martin. Um, and because she was a foreigner and uh, Jean Badovici had French citizenship, she actually purchased the plot of land in his name and effectively made him the client and she was the architect on what was to be their joint villa. And that's, you'll see that on... The slide, that's the cove, and that's the, the house uh, sits back just above the cliff. And what made her villa so amazing, um, there's a few things that are pretty pretty astonishing about it. Uh, it was given an enigmatic name. It's actually E1027, which is the same as her uh, very iconic table. E was for Eileen. The 10 is uh, for J, or the 10th letter of the alphabet, which is for Jean. Um, two for... Uh, which was B or Badavici and seven is G so gray and the actual villa itself was very much formulated on Le Corbusier's five points of the new architecture it ha was an open floor plan and it stood on pillars it again tried to maximize the view so there was a emphasis on horizontal windows um, it was an open facade and the roof was accessible by a staircase 
However, what makes her villa particularly amazing was she was very critical of modernist and avant-garde movement and its focus primarily on the exterior of buildings. She wrote, the interior plan should not be the incidental result, result of the facade. It should lead to a complete, harmonious, and logical life. So this is where her background in interiors comes into play. Um, she looked at the house in its entirety um, as something worthy of design. So not only does she design, you know, the walls and the facade, but she also designs furniture. So if you look at that slide, you can see she had made some modular furniture. So the house is exceedingly clean in its lines. She wanted no adornment. She wanted everything to be very functional. So Le Corbusier was a noted fan of her work um, at E1027, and he often visited. Um, in 1938 and 1939, he took up like a mini residency there, and whilst he was there, he vandalized her walls and painted eight Cubist-style um, murals, and she was livid. Again, she was a fan of clean lines and she wanted everything to have its place and to be completely unadorned. Um, you can see if you flip to the next slide, well actually on that slide you can see one of the murals, but if you flip to the next slide you can actually see him in the buff painting. Um, historian Rowan Moore called it an act of naked philocracy by a man asserting his dominion like a urinating dog over the territory. Architectural historian Beatriz Colomina described Le Corbusier's actions as misogynistic declaration of war against Gray. So Gray fell out with her lover, Badovici, and abandoned the villa. Eventually, Le Corbusier also had a falling out with Badovici. Again, it was technically his property because it was in his name, and uh, Corbusier loved the area so much he erected his own small dwelling nearby. Um, tragically, he actually died swimming in that cove right off the, co uh, off the coast of E1027. Uh, the villa fell into disrepair and was vandalized heavily. Its construction was often not even attributed to Gray. It was often attributed to Badovici or, or even Le Corbusier. Um, in 1999, it was declared a national monument and purchased by a commune with the help of the French government. It has now undergone considerable repair. Um, what makes the repair of the villa very interesting is that its restoration is obviously mired in a lot of political intricacies because people want to preserve um, his murals and they were literally a defilement of her space and so the question becomes do you preserve it as she intended it or do you you know acknowledge that this thing happened in this space and then keep the murals so I don't know Tragically, Gray died on Halloween 1976 and um, further kind of really hammering in her anonymity, um, she's buried in a cemetery in Paris and her grave is unmarked because um, she's Irish and I guess there's a sizable license fee to have your grave identified if you're from out of the country. And so she's buried in an unmarked grave in Paris. So those are the three women three women that i wanted to shed light on um and again i i really wanted to try to magnify their accomplishments as standalone achievements as much as possible but i think that given how little is known about female architects um from ancient history to even as early as I mean, she, she died in 76. Um, I, I think the, it's such a catch-22 because these men and their great work and their, you know, collaboration with these incredible women um, allows us to know the snippets that we know about them. Um, but I encourage all of you 
to do more research if this has at all been of interest because again like I said it's just the tip of the iceberg these were dynamic very creative women living in very different times but producing things that are arguably still relevant and still amazing today.